Welcome back. Good afternoon. Uh, we are here, episode 13 for Let's Have Lunch. We appreciate everybody hanging out with us. And um, uh, we we're going to do a little call out to a viewer shortly who, uh, who's been with us, I think, every episode. But, um, but we really appreciate you guys uh, hanging in there and for all the questions and interest. Today, we are going to spend a little bit of time talking about um, I Hate My Neck, uh, probably one of the more common uh, problems that we hear about and there are a lot of different solutions. Some are non-surgical and some are surgical. But we're going to go through, we're going to show a few case studies and um, uh, Hope and Karen and Karen are just going to talk about it and uh, we'll see if if there are any questions while we're here, please please feel free to send them in. So I'm going to try to do this. Well first let me introduce Hope and Karen and Karen again. They're back and uh, I am going to put up this photo here to start with and um, can you guys see that on your end everybody okay yeah. okay so uh, these are not our patients I uh, this morning I just grabbed a few photos just so we could have some discussion points but these are patients that commonly come in and um, I think what I'll do is have uh, Karen and Hope discuss a little bit if the patient on the left comes in what um, what sorts of things can we offer? What can we do for that patient? So whomever wants to start here. You can go ahead, to jump in, Hope. Um, I can start if you want to. Okay. All right. So looking at the side profile of this patient, you can tell that she's got a little bit of excessive submental fat. So that's that little fat that we refer to as the double chin. Um, this is typically a genetic type of issue. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're overweight or anything like that. It just, sometimes you get this little pouchy area underneath the chin and it does, it makes people uncomfortable in photos, especially from the side and it makes people self-conscious. So, you know, when you treat this area non-surgically and surgically, and sometimes a combination of the two, it really does boost the confidence of patients. And I know myself, I've had, different treatments in this area because genetically in my family, it, it, it does cause an issue underneath the chin. And um, so one thing that we can do is called Kybella. I don't think we've really discussed this yet during our FB Live, so that's a good one um, to go through. Kybella is deoxycholic acid. It is used to treat submental fat. And so what we can do is inject it in this area under here. Um, you do have a bit of swelling afterwards, we call it, it kind of looks a little bullfroggy and you know, it really does. So we, we tell you to plan for a day or two to just really, unless you don't mind having that extra swelling here to just kind of have no, no events, no dinners out with your girlfriends or with your guy friends or whatever. Um, but with one treatment, it really does reduce this area. I usually have people plan on two or three. Sometimes you need even four. So everybody's a little bit different and depending on the amount of fat and how your fat responds to the Kybella, um, that's a really good treatment option. Karen, anything you wanna add about Kybella to that area down there? I know you use it um, on other areas of the body too, but. I do know. I think that's great, Hope, and she is such an ideal candidate. Mm -hmm. At, and I would start with Kybella for her because until you reduce some of that excess volume under here, it's going to be hard to accomplish the other things we would like to do for her. Exactly. Yep. Would you like for me to talk about the next step of injectables for her then? Sure, sure. So injectable fillers are actually extremely helpful for this beautiful young lady as well. Um, one thing you'll notice on the picture on the right is that her jawline shows much more definition. Part of that is because she's lost volume underneath her chin. And my guess is that she's also had some injectable filler to define the jawline. Uh, I'm hearing the term a snatched jawline, meaning that it's tighter and more defined and that's a you know very desirable look today also as you look at her side profile her chin is a bit recessed the lips on this patient look the same from right to left 
although she may have had a little filler in her lips, but she definitely has had some filler to define the contour of her chin. So not only are we reducing volume under the chin with an injectable Kybella, but we're defining and adding volume uh, to the lower face with injectable fillers. Anything else there, Hope? I'm going to uh, try yeah. to get back here myself. Okay. I think that was great. That was great. Um, so, yeah, so Kybella, we talked about that. Um, and uh, just uh, hope, I might, have, I might have missed this, so I apologize. But with Kybella, what should somebody expect with regards to the skin? And um, so the patient that we were just looking at, uh, chronological age, I guess, is relative, being, being young. But she had nice, healthy skin. She had some extra stuff here. A non-surgical approach with Kybella, as Hope mentioned, would be great. But what should she expect with the skin? I mean, will Kybella take care of that for her? Yeah, so looking at that photo, you're right with the chronological age. It looks like she's a little bit younger, and so her skin has that elasticity. It has that ability to rebound really well or, you know, kind of tighten along with the, the fat as the fat goes, goes down. Now, if you have skin laxity in that area or you have a looser appearance to the skin, the skin quality isn't quite as good, I would recommend treating that either first or along with your Kybella treatments, depending on the patient. And when we meet with you and look with you, we'll discuss what you're a candidate for or not. But you can run into a problem when you have a skin laxity issue in the neck and then you reduce the fat, deflating that fat will make the skin laxity appear worse. It will look looser in this area, as you can imagine. So typically we will treat in uh, combination with the Kybella, we'll do something for the skin. So if you have mild skin laxity or you're not really seeing much of that yet, a lot of the times we'll do something preventatively so something like a microneedle with radio frequency, this helps to tighten and firm skin. So we can do that in the neck area, also coming up on the cheeks a bit to help lift and tighten that area here along with your Kybella treatment. If you're noticing moderate to more severe skin laxity, it might be more of a surgical option that would be better for you because sometimes we just need to remove that redundant skin and do, you know, at the same time, a submental liposuction so that you could get the result that you're really going for. Does that help? <laughs> so, yeah, no, that's great. Um, and can you just, uh, maybe Karen, maybe you can just explain a little bit with Kybella what a patient should expect following the treatment. Um, you know, if I was just treated today, what can I do the rest of the day? Sure. So. Oh, I'll even jump a little bit earlier. When you come in for treatment, we're going to cleanse the skin. We're going to mark the area that we want to focus the injections on. And we're going to give you a bag of ice and we're going to have you ice your under chin area, that submental area, and get it very, very cold. The needle that we use is really tiny. We're putting droplets of the Kybella injection evenly into the area under the skin where we're targeting the fat. Then we keep the ice on it and usually you ice for about a half hour afterwards. Once the injection and that initial stinging subsides and the ice does a beautiful job of counteracting the stinging, you don't feel any residual pain. Sometime over the next few hours, you're going to start noticing swelling. And Hope mentioned bullfrogginess and people describe it as that. So this fat has been destroyed by the injectable. Uh, Kybella, which is deoxycholic acid. The reaction of your body to that cell destruction is to send in white blood cells and lymphatic fluid to carry away the debris. So you do get an inflammatory reactive swelling. And you'll notice it probably by that evening. Uh, it'll be worse when you wake up. For most patients, the worst of that swelling lasts between two and five days. Everybody's a little bit different. I always tell patients, be aware that you're noticing it. At first, everybody might notice it, but people are much more conscious of this area on themselves than they are on other people. 
So when staff members would get treated and they'd come in and they'd say, oh my God, look how swollen I still am. I'd have to admit that I wasn't really noticing it. So, but I think allowing a three days, four days is usually a very safe window for most people. You can take Advil, Aleve, Ibuprofen, you can use ice, you can wear a neck brace. None of those seems, things seem to really make a significant difference in the amount of swelling, but they don't interfere with the results either. So they might make you feel more comfortable. But we do these treatments a lot more during cooler weather when someone can wear a turtleneck or a scarf and camouflage the fact that they've got swelling. And then afterwards, because of the residual from that inflammation, Patients will say it feels a little numb. The skin feels a little bit funny. Uh, sometimes it feels a little bit loose or jiggly, I think people have said. And it's just the body's reaction, you know, this inflammatory reaction that's causing what you're noticing. And it can take two months for everything to feel completely normal again. So kind of if you've ever had a wasp or a bee sting, how this, the swelling is gone, it doesn't hurt, but the skin can still feel a little bit funny that's the type of sensation you might have. It's very tolerable, it's very doable. And um, while it won't tighten the skin, sometimes you do see a little bit of a retraction of the skin due to the inflammation, um, but the skins still need additional treatment like Hope was talking about. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, because sometimes people respond differently with the amount of inflammation they have, you know, when you're here, we'll, we'll ice it for you, we'll keep you here for a little bit and we'll recommend the same thing. But uh, that inflammatory process isn't always such a bad thing. Uh, as Karen was just saying, sometimes it can feel like you've got a little waddle or something going on, and sometimes patients will be concerned that maybe it's stretching their skin. In fact, that inflammatory process, like Karen was just mentioned, can actually help retract the skin. There's some fibrosis, some internal scar tissue that actually might contract some of it. So it's not going to take care of a big waddle. We're going to look at another photo in a minute, but... Um, uh, so, but it, but it will help. You won't end up with extra skin, let's just say that. It also isn't going to get rid of a ton of extra skin, so it's really about the fat. Um, all right, so, and then just one other thing while I'm trying to pull this up, maybe one of you can answer this. How many, how many treatments would you say that patient that we saw, and I'll, I'll pull her back up again here, would, um, would typically uh, require? I would guesstimate probably three. That's what I would. Karen. That's what I would say as well, because she really achieved a very defined look, mm -hmm. and I think she'd see improvement after two. She would definitely be seeing improvement, but she probably did a third to get that sculpting yeah. that she's looking for. Okay, and then just real quickly, I'd also like to mention you guys touched on this, but while we have her, because I, I think the other photos are from the frontal view. Um, normally, if you look at her, we'll call her the before photo on the left, you'll see that her, uh, Karen talked about the lip. If you drop a vertical line down from the lip, in women, we like to see that chin approach that imaginary line. And in men, we like to see it at the line or maybe a little bit extended beyond it. So her chin is a little bit weak and, uh, you know, she might benefit it. The Kybella certainly will, will help by itself, but placing a chin implant is something I would say about 10% of our patients are candidates for that sort of thing. It might be performed in combination with rhinoplasty. It might be performed in combination with lower facial rejuvenation. It might be performed by itself uh, in an in instance like this. And uh, chin augmentation, a chin implant uh, is a procedure performed under local anesthesia. You come in, we all have a little natural crease under our chin here, or 80% of us from falling as a child have a scar there already. But We'll, make, we'll localize the area, we'll make a little incision here, and we place this little implant. The implant is made of a silastic or a Gore-Tex material. These are inert materials, and what that means is they'll last forever, so they're permanent, but they're reversible. So that's quite nice. We can augment the chin to balance. You remember in prior talks, we talked about the vertical thirds of the face, from the hairline to the brow, the brow to the base of the nose, and the base of the nose to the chin, roughly. And both in height and in projection. And in this case, when the chin is weak, somebody might complain, they might come in and say, hey doc, I need a nose job, and they don't. They need their chin balanced. In this case, with the lower neck, the neck might not look so great. Um, and if, they've, if there is a weak chin, then a chin implant might, uh, might be a reasonable thing to consider. Additionally, fillers can be used for that. We don't 
come. This is one of the few implants, chin, chin implants, that we continue to use. We don't use cheek implants the way we used to. We don't use a lot of other implants because fillers are so great. Uh, with the chins, most patients who desire a chin implant usually go for a chin implant versus filler, uh, only because it's permanent, but it's a reversible. Why would it be reversible? Let's say you were in a motor vehicle accident or for whatever reason, it can always be removed. So, um, all right, so let's see if I can move to the next one here. And let's see, Hope, you started the last one. I'll give this one to Karen. So this patient comes in and um, has some issues. Tell me what you're seeing and tell me what you think. Well, that is quite a double chin going on there. Mm -hmm. And she definitely is not a Kybella candidate. Uh, it would take way too much product and way too many treatments. Um, I would refer her for laser hair removal. Uh, won't get rid of her gray hair, but it'll get rid of the dark hairs. But I would also be referring her to you, Dr. Mendelssohn, because she really is someone who not only needs liposuction, she needs an advanced lift and she needs a skin excision. In other words, there's just too much extra here to tighten, to shrink. Uh, she needs to get rid of both skin and fat. I, I think she'd be coming back your direction. Okay, so, right, so a patient like this might come in for Kybella. We have seen some nice results in, in, in patients who have real heavy necks. Um, neck anatomy wise, we, we talk about this. So, you know, so this is our larynx, right? Our, the, our, the structure of our, our throat here. There's a little bone above our Adam's apple called the hyoid bone. It's actually cartilage, but it ossifies, it turns the bone as we age. And there's nothing we can do about that position. So sometimes that bone is very high and towards the back, very superior and posterior, and people have a nice right angle neck. Sometimes that hyoid bone is low and anterior and you don't have a neck at all. It looks like you don't have a chin or a neck. And uh, there's not a lot we can do about the position of that. But in a situation like this, first of all, we want to uh, evaluate the patient to see how much fat there is. Um, I agree with Karen. I don't think Kybella or submental liposuction alone, submental means under the chin, liposuction would, would be uh, the best thing. Let me just review what submental liposuction is. You come in this time as well under local anesthesia. We make a little, it's called a stab incision, a tiny little incision. We don't even use a suture to close it. And we literally lose, use a little liposuction cannula to remove that fatty tissue. When you leave, we usually put a little sling on just to support the skin. Uh, it's about a 20 minute procedure and um, that can be used. In this instance though, as Karen said, what we would do is we would probably make that incision a little bit longer the same size incision, for example, we might use for the chin implant. And we would do liposuction, we would remove the fat, but we can also, if you can see, this extra skin that I'm grabbing here, we can actually excise or remove some of that so that we can uh, create more definition and get rid of some of the redundant tissue there. Uh, so that would be, that would probably be the minimalist, uh, the, the least amount that we would uh, probably offer this patient because most people coming in with this want results and even though uh, Kybella could be used, it probably wouldn't give us the result we want. So that's number one. Number two is the advanced lift, the lower face lifting procedure. I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm probably going to do that uh, over the weekend here in a little more detail, but, uh, but those two things would be reasonable. And of course, we can't see this person's profile. If the chin was weak at all, that a chin implant, chin augmentation might also help because it might create more horizontal distance here to delineate the jaw and neckline a little bit better as well. So those are some things that we can do. Um, all right, let's see the next one here, if I can get to the next one. All right, I guess we're back to hope on this one. All right, Hope. So this patient comes in and you've been treating her with Botox and fillers and skincare and she shows you what she doesn't like. Tell me about this. All right. So you can, the first thing that I'm drawn to is you can see that motion she's making with her mouth in the first picture, her before, and you can see that muscle being pulled down. These are called the DAOs. Uh, this is a muscle that pulls the lateral corners of our mouth down. And we can use something like a neurotoxin, like Botox, Dysport, Xeomin, Jabot, 
into these muscles and that helps relax that muscle back upwards to give our mouth a more upturned look. The other thing is these platysmal bands when she's making that, that kind of face, these platysmal bands are coming out like this. You can see them in that photo. But we can also run a little bit of neurotoxin down that band and relax it kind of backwards. And so it would help to soften and that's what it looks like. I think this is what that looks like that she had done. But also surgically, there's an option for those platysmal bands as well that would be a longer term option because Botox or a neurotoxin will only last a few months. Of course, skin care also is recommended in there, but is that what you saw, Dr. Mendelson? Yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, probably, you're right, probably a non-surgical approach in initially would be uh, would be the best thing. You know, if you look at her face, the rest of her face, uh, you know, usually we'll ask you, if, if you come in like this, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we'll ask is, are there any other concerns? And we're not trying to point out any other concerns. We're trying to see if uh, really what the overall concerns are. So for her, and can you guys see my cursor on here or not? Yes. Oops. So... You know, I would ask her, and what I'm getting at is, does she have concerns along her jawline or jowl or cheek or any other way? And, and she actually looks pretty good. I mean, I know we're only seeing part of her face. And the reason why I ask that is because, do we want to move to some other surgical procedure? And with her, I, I, don't, think, I don't think we'd even offer it. So what Hope's saying is with a neurotoxin, um, with Botox, uh, she should have a pretty decent result. Karen, do you have any uh, additional suggestions for her? Let's see. I feel like her skin also looks much better in the second picture. So I'm wondering what skin treatments she might has, have had because often by the time you get platysmal bands, you also have skin laxity. And it looks like she takes great care of her skin. And I would also mention that um, on the left, her jawline looks like perhaps her masseter muscle is a little bit more engaged and we do when people have a very pronounced masseter muscle we do use botox or a neurotoxin into that area the masseter is what you feel when you clench your jaw or right here and um asian women especially don't love that square look they want a more narrow face and so we'll if their masseter is really pronounced or strong you can use botox into that muscle to relax it somebody who has TMJ or clenches their teeth a lot will have a pronounced uh, masseter. And you can put your finger right along your jawline and clench the back of your teeth. And you'll feel that muscle engaging. And it looks like maybe they treated her masseter as well to give her a little bit of slimming right here. That was the only other thing that I saw. So kind of amazing actually, right? That we can use uh, one uh, neurotoxin for all those areas and, um, and you know, improve things. So, um, all right, so let's see. We've talked a little bit about, and uh, I'll try to do this again, is, um, let's see if I can get you to, okay. So here is another patient. Um, I think we see a lot of patients coming in looking like this. And uh, Karen, uh, why don't we go back to you for this one and see what uh, your thoughts are here. Uh oh, just excellent, thank you. So this patient really would benefit from several treatments, I think. One is we do wanna engage her in skincare and make sure she's doing everything she can to deal with laxity of the face. But looking at her, you can see that her jawline is droopy or saggy. She has what we would call jowls and her neck has extra tissue and it's drooping and sagging. And I feel like the advanced lift would be the ideal solution to help address both of those issues in combination with skincare. And um, with the advanced lift, we are kind of doing what people do when they look in the mirror. You put your fingers along your jawline and look back a little bit, put your fingers along your neck and you lift back and things tighten and smooth. And it, you can see that also the corners of her mouth are a little bit softer. She could use some filler there for the downturn mouth, maybe a little bit of Botox in the DAO, like Hope was talking about. But I love that in this before and after, her jawline, the jowling is much improved. The excess laxity of her neck skin is much improved. And so the overall appearance is 
really much more youthful. Yeah, and you know, for her, um, you, um, you know, again, this is, we pulled this from the internet, but so, you know, she still has some stuff going on, but as Karen's saying, really what we want to be uh, focused on is, I'm going to bring myself back here, is when there, um, when there are a lot of things going on. So I mentioned earlier that, you know, we'll ask patients, are there any concerns? So this patient comes in, she complains about her neck. Say, so, okay, fine. I think if anybody looked at her, again, we're not picking on her, but if you looked at her, my guess is her concern is probably just, uh, just looking more refreshed. And that happens to be her jawline and her jaw. Everything has moved downward. Gravity, loss of volume, all of those things that we're always trying to manage. She probably has, she does have platysma bands. She has poorer elasticity of her skin. So she'd be somebody who'd be a surgical candidate for a lower facelifting procedure, what we call an advanced lift, uh, potentially a platysmoplasty, uh, skin management through products at home through uh, treatments with the estheticians, microneedling, rate of frequency, maybe the dot laser. So, um, so you can see as we kind of move uh, through the process of aging, there are different conditions that each person has. So it's not one size fits all. When we talk about a procedure, that procedure is modified for the problems and the anatomy of the patient that we're, that we're managing. And, um, and so these are just some of the things that we look at you know, during consultations. Um, I just want to try one more time. Let's see, I'm going to head back here and I just want to show you what we've been talking about. So this is from a nice little <clears throat> anatomy app, a 3D anatomy. It's really pretty amazing. It's just a screenshot. But this muscle, this big broad muscle is the platysmoplasty, it's the platysma muscle, excuse me. And the, <clears throat> the medial aspect of each of these muscles, they usually join in the midline or the connection is very attenuated, that means it's very weakened. And over time, commonly, we see them separate. And as we do, we can see the edges of those muscles and we call that banding. And uh, with, uh, as Hope mentioned earlier, with the uh, Botox for uh, platysma banding, that can work. Surgically, sometimes what we'll do is we'll make a little incision, we'll find the right and the left edge of those muscles, and we'll use some sutures to sort of uh, not to sort of, but to bring those back together so that they'll fibrose or internally scar and they'll stick together so we won't see those bands. As you can see though, this muscle is a big, broad muscle. So it's not even close, right, at the lower we get in the neck. So the, the portion that we're really addressing with platysmoplasty is this part sort of right underneath the neck here. We're bringing this stuff together, maybe to the hyoid, right to this area here. Um, to clean up the bands in that area. And um, so I just wanted to go through some of that just so you got a sense for, um, you know, for the types of things that, uh, that we do. Um, well, uh, let's see, what else? Can we talk about anything else in the neck? Uh, talk about the, tech, the overall quality of the skin in terms of loss of elasticity and what we do for that. Maybe hope you can start uh, that conversation a little bit. Sure. So yes, the neck. So this is typically what we're going to notice aging pretty quickly, even sometimes before the face, we have patients come in and they're bothered with their neck. Now, sometimes people aren't even bothered by that. And they may say, I only don't like these lines right here. And you know, we can always put little fillers or do some skincare or something for that. But the neck skin does tend to age quickly. And so I think it's really important to have a good skincare product. Uh, we have multiple different ones. Elastin Neck is a great product that's going to stimulate collagen. It's gonna stimulate elastin, which helps our skin to look more youthful, to act more youthful. It's going to be a little bit thicker, a little bit tighter, and also preventatively. Um, you know, if you're noticing your neck skin starting to get looser, it's only gonna get worse. So we have to do some things to really reverse the years on that. So good products are one, um, trying to avoid the sun as much as you can on your neck. I know I wear my hair up a lot. When you're working in the yard, you just get sun. The sun does tend to hit the sides of the neck here a lot and people don't often think of putting sunscreen down there as much as they do on their face or sunblock. And so that's important as well, making sure that you're getting your sun protection on your neck. In office treatments, there's a variety. You can do something with low downtime, like a microneedle. We can do something that's a little bit more aggressive. 
like a resurfacing laser, the dot laser that Dr. Mendelson was talking about. We could do microneedling with radio frequency and all of these things are going to help trigger collagen and stimulate elastin, also tighten the skin in that area uh, non-surgically. We often recommend those in addition to your surgical options as well, just because we want to keep the skin in good health. We want to protect our investment. We want things to last and make sure that our skin stays nice and tight. So those are very important things. Um, what else? Anything else, Dr. Mendelson, that you're thinking of? No, I think, um, I think I just wanted to draw attention again to kind of this, I don't know, global approach. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty thorough. Um, depending upon what what the needs are, and in you know, a surgery, it is excellent, can be excellent, but without you know supporting it with managing skin properly, uh, maybe the results uh, won't be as great, and vice versa. Uh, Non-surgical treatments with injections and skincare are are definitely um, awesome. Sometimes they don't do enough, and we need to we need to assist things with uh, with surgical intervention as well. So. Um, well, I think we've covered that pretty well. Um, over the weekend, you know, I want to wish everybody a happy Easter and uh, Passover for those that are celebrating. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't talked to these ladies yet, but I'm probably going to be solo uh, at least some point over the weekend. And what I intend to do is probably review some of the uh, advanced lift. I know last week I started with um, the upper blepharoplasty and kind of walked through the steps there. Um, but um, we've got a lot of topics to cover still. We do appreciate everybody uh, joining us. Keep sending in your comments and uh, we'll cover what we can. We're all looking forward to getting back to work here soon. Hopefully it will be May 1st. So thank you guys, I appreciate it. Bye everybody.